Praise the Lord. We're so glad you joined us tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study or the study in the Word. And we want to encourage you to get your Bible there where you are. Those of you that are here with us in the worship center also want you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, if you'll go there with me. You know, we're living in a time of distress in our nation, as you all are aware of. We're in the middle of a culture war. Uh, it's been going on for decades. It's nothing new. But it seems like the war has accelerated more and more. Uh, and, you know, slowly but surely throughout the decades, it's infiltrated all the stratas of our life and of our country, all the institutions. And so in this culture war, uh, really, we can't avoid it. It's in our schools. It's in our movies. It's in our entertainment, our sports. It's even infiltrated our churches, so-called Christian churches. But I want to talk to you today about this area of culture and what affects our culture. You know, what is a culture anyway? A culture is basically an aggregate of people, people a group of people that have come together to live together, whether it's in a nation or a group. Or, uh, and it's basically their way of living, the things that they are accustomed to doing and the things that they all kind of do together. But uh, the culture war uh, is what... Uh, every one of us can't avoid it. We are experiencing today, as a matter of fact, if you're watching the news today, you saw uh, where it is kind of uh, overblown now to the point where things have become rather unstable and uh, everybody blames everybody else. But this culture war is on and it's going on. However, the culture war is not really what Jesus set us against. We're in the middle of it, but it is not really because it's not really the source of the war. Culture being an aggregate of people together in a nation, as I said, or in a group, uh, influences in one another in some kind of way. We're all influenced by our culture. Uh, people influencing other people. That's basically what it is. Um, so culture is influenced by something or someone. And I want to share with you today about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is a good place to start, I was thinking about this as I was watching the news today and, and uh, thought about what's happening in our nation and in our country. You might be concerned as well as you ought to be, uh, but instead of being worried, you should be praying and you should be calling upon God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, Paul uh, says this, and he's talking here about the things that the uh, Corinthians were involved in, many of them have come from paganism. And so now they are Christians and they are uh, partaking of the Lord's table. And so Paul is concerned that uh, they understand how important and how holy that is. But he makes a reference to something that I, in passing that I'd like to point out to you. And he says in verse 18, consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices, he says, participants in the altar? He asks the question. The people of Israel, when they offer their sacrifices to God, he says, aren't they participating at the altar while they're offering those sacrifices? Who are they offering them to? Well, Paul says they're offering them to God. And then he says in verse 19, what do I imply then? Because he's talking here about, you know, not... Uh, 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 making light of the Lord's table. When you come to the Lord's table, he says, some of you come like it was, a, it was just a regular thing, but it said it's a holy thing. You come to partake. And he says, what do I imply then that food offered to idols, he says, is anything, or that an idol is anything, because he just said to them in verse 14 to flee idolatry. But here's what he says. What am I saying? Am I saying that food offered to idols is anything? In other words, uh, or that an idol is anything? I mean, do they have any real existence? Are those sacrifices really accomplishing something? Because idols, he said, don't exist. Idols are made by human beings. Again, cultural things. And in this culture, there was a lot of idolatry, outward idolatry. And so uh, with the idolatry temples all around, the Christians weren't uh, needed to know uh, what was going on. And he says, I'm not saying that food offered to idol by these people are, is anything. But he says this, consider, he says, what I do imply then, 
Or what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything. Verse 20. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, in other words, all the religious things and cultural things that they're doing there as, as, uh, in their culture as idolaters. He says, the pagans sacrifice these things. They offer them to demons and not to God. But did you know that the pagans that Paul is talking about here, they don't know, they don't believe that what they're doing is offering demons sacrifices. They think they're offering them to the gods. But remember, Paul says there isn't any other god. Idols aren't anything. Our idols don't have an existence. They only exist in people's minds. And they build uh, physical things to represent them. But he says they're not real. And so what pagans are sacrificing, he said, even though it's not real, they are being promoted and moved by something and he says they are demons. They sacrifice to demons. They don't sacrifice to God. Now, they might be under the impression that they're doing it. But Paul says the reality is that they're not. He says, and I don't want you to be participants with demons because whatever you offer at an altar, he says, you participate in that. Israel offers all uh, 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 sacrifices to God, and they participate in that sacrifice. And he says, and what the pagans are offering, he says, they are offering to demons. That's very interesting, to demons. Because demons are what move idolatry in a culture. In other words, idols don't have an existence, but the demons who promote people into idolatry are very real. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, at verse 18, Paul writes to his son Timothy, son in the faith, and he says to him in verse 18 of 1 Timothy 1, I charge you, he says, and I entrust to you this charge, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them, that is by the prophecies that had been, the word of God that had been spoken over his life, you may wage the good warfare. Another translation says a noble warfare. Notice, and he's telling him that he is involved in a war, in a warfare. And he says that the prophetic word that has been uh, uttered over him, he needs to stand in it so that he can wage a good and a noble war. Now, Paul is talking here about this war, and he talks about this war in other places in the Scripture we're going to look in a moment. But I want you to know that the primary level of, that the church is involved in, in warfare. The primary level of that warfare is between God and Satan. That's the primary level of the war. All right? And then between God's truth and Satan's lies. Between God's will and Satan's will. See, the battle is fought not only between God and Satan, but between demons and angels. The warfare is fought between godly men and ungodly men. And I want you to see that because, and as I said, the ultimate level of warfare is between God and the devil. And we're kind of caught in the middle. But because we're caught in the middle doesn't mean that we are not to participate. As a matter of fact, if you don't participate, you will be a captive in this war. And so Paul reminds Timothy, there's a word of God that was spoken over you, the prophetic word, and you are to, uh, he says, uh, by these words, you are to wage a noble or a good warfare. So God's truth and Satan's lies. God's will and Satan's will. You know, uh, godly men and ungodly men. All these are involved in this warfare. Now, in order for us to understand warfare, as the Scripture really uh, uh, points it out, as the Apostle Paul writes about it, because a lot of th stuff has been said about spiritual warfare that just ain't true. You know, and they try to make it something, you know, uh, kind of mystical. But it isn't. There is a real war going on between God and the devil. There's a real war between, you know, demons and, and holy angels and between godly men and ungodly Men. Now, we had to understand this warfare. Now, Jesus said something interesting about uh, preparing for battle. He said, what king going out to war, he says, first doesn't calculate what kind of an army really the other, the other king has coming against him. He doesn't, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't just go off into war. 
He has to understand the terms of the battle, of the conflict. He has to understand the strategies of the battle that he's going to fight. How many are coming against him? So Jesus said, a king who is going out to war, he prepares for this. He understands that this war is uh, going to be won if he understands what's really happening. And I think in the spiritual aspect of our life, we need to understand what spiritual warfare is. Satan hates God. That's the whole basis upon this spiritual war. Satan hates God. You and I are incidental to him. Yes, he attacks us and yes, he hates us. But the only reason he hates us is because we, he hates God and we are bearers of God's glory. Man was created in the image and likeness of God. And saved believers, you, if you're a Christian today, you bear the glory of God in your life. And he hates anything that brings glory to God. He hates you and I because of whom we represent. You know, oftentimes when we as Christians are, are, uh, make ourselves known as Christians, even in, maybe in our workplace, maybe in your school or wherever you work, sometimes people don't like you just because you're a Christian. They might not know you. They might not know anything about you. But just the fact that you're a Christian bothers them. Okay? And the reason is, and sometimes they don't even understand why, because you represent a danger to them and you represent glory for God and the devil hates God. Now, it's interesting that, you know, because God could defeat the devil, couldn't he? If God chose you with a breath of it, chose for the breath of his mouth, he could annihilate Satan. Yet God allows the battle against him to be fought at our level. Think about that. God could destroy the, the, the enemy right away, and he's going to do it in the end of the age. God, the, when Jesus returns, he's going to confine the devil to the bottomless pit. He's going to destroy his influence. He's going to destroy his work. And God could do it right now if he wanted to. But yet God has chosen to allow the battle of the devil and the hatred of the devil against him to be fought right here among us between godly men and ungodly men between righteous holy angels and demons. And we are involved in this. But God wants us to understand that our victory, His victory is our victory. His glory is our glory. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, there is a story there about a battle that went on in Israel. In 2 Samuel 23, beginning at verse 9. And these are... The, the, the men mentioned here are David's mighty men of valor. And in 2 Samuel 23, verse 9, it says that they were fighting uh, the battle. Israel was fighting the battle against the uh, Philistines. It says, and next to him among the three mighty men was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, son of Ohio. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines. This is uh, uh, Eliezer. He says, he struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. Think about that. Here is a guy fighting a battle. It's a physical battle. It's a, it's a battle of conquest. And he is fighting in the name of the Lord. And he, his hand is on the sword. This wasn't some kind of make-believe battle, some kind of, you know, uh, 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 you know, hologram battle in the, in the TV. No, this is a real battle. And his hand clung to the Lord. He actually did the fighting. He struck the enemies of Israel, the Philistines. And then it says, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. So who was the battle really against? It was against the Lord. David, remember David had said to the giant, the Philistine, you come to me, you know, with sword and spear, you know, and I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, whom you have defied. And so here is Eliezer, and he strikes down the enemies of Israel. But it says that the Lord was the one who gave him the victory. And then in verse 11, he goes on and he says this. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. This is the, the, the Israelites. They were afraid. But there was one of David's mighty men who took his stand, this was Shammah, in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And again, he struck down the Philistines. It was his hand on the sword. It, he was the one defending it. 
But the Lord was the one who worked the victory. The Lord worked a great victory. You see, we are in the middle of a warfare. We're fighting principalities and powers. We're fighting Satan's kingdom. But it is the Lord that gives us the victory because ultimately it's his victory. And ultimately the devil is not so much interested in us as he is in destroying God's glory. Because you remember... What was it that Satan wanted in heaven? What is it that Lucifer, uh, Satan was known as Lucifer in heaven. What is it that he wanted in heaven? He wanted to ascend, right, to the throne of God. He wanted to have the glory of God. He had his own glory. God had made him a glorious creature. But he didn't have the glory of God. The fullness of the glory only belongs to him. And so he wanted that glory and he didn't get it. God kicked him out of heaven. So anytime you want to take God's glory away from him, you can be sure you're going to get kicked out of whatever. And so we don't ever go to try to handle the glory of God without reverence and without respect. But what I want you to see is they fought the battles, but the victory came from the Lord. Because ultimately, the spiritual warfare we're in is a fight between the devil and God. And it is fought on our level. It is fought right here where we live. Now, God is wise and he's wise in everything that he does. God has purposes and God has plans. And, you know, he often lets his enemies, because people wonder, you know, well, why, why would the Lord allow his people to be conquered? Why would the Lord allow this or that to happen, contrary to his purposes? You know, God often lets his enemies think that they're winning. And sometimes he, he lets them think that they've won. You remember Joseph? I mean, Joseph was God's man. And yet he was abused, he was falsely accused, he was thrown in prison, he was, you know, everything that could happen to him happened to him. And everybody thought, well, Joseph's dead, Joseph's sold, he's off into slavery, who knows where he's going to be. And yet God in time emerges emerges, or, or brings him up over there in Egypt as the second in command to the Pharaoh. God has purposes and plans. And when everything You know, it looks like it's gone. You know, the the children of Israel were taken over by the Babylonians. You remember that? They came and they conquered him. God allowed them to do that. And the Babylonians thought, okay, well, we've got, you know, Israel, the supposed people of God. You know, we've got them now. They're our slaves. They're our servants. They thought they had won. And what does God do? What, What did the Persians do? The Persians came also after that, and they enslaved Israel for another hundred years or so. And they thought they had won. But what happens? With time, God comes, even though God allowed that to happen, that battle to happen, and for them to be subdued, God comes back, judges Babylon, and judges the Persians. Because God often lets his enemies think that they have won. Because he has a purpose. Look at the cross. I mean, the the religious leaders of the day thought they had got rid of Jesus. Okay, we won. We finally got rid of this madman. We finally got rid of this guy who's upsetting our religious traditions and ideas. The devil thought he had won because he had got him crucified. But on the third day, Jesus said, that's, uh, God said, that's enough, and he raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Because God often th- allows the enemy to think that he's won, but he hasn't won. And don't ever make that uh, mistake in thinking our enemies have won. Our enemies have won. Oh, the enemy is, you know, he, he got over on God. No, he didn't. God allows things to happen because he has a greater purpose. You know, today you might be here, you might be disappointed at the elections, of, uh, you know, the, the fraud that has gone on and all that was perpetrated and how it all turned out, it seems like, against us. It's kind of like the, the, the disciples who came upon, you know, uh, you know what do we do wrong? What, you know, what, what happened? What, you know, why is God impotent? Can God not do what we thought he would do or what we think he can do. Remember, God can destroy the devil right now if he wanted to, but he chose not to. He chose to allow the devil to fight his battle against him right here with us in the middle. And you and I are tasked to fight a good fight, to fight the fight of faith, to fight this warfare, this noble warfare that we're involved in. Now, You might be disappointed, like I said, but it's kind of like the man that uh, was sitting on the side of the road. The disciples came by and saw him. He was a man who was born, uh, you know, remember he was born blind. And they asked Jesus, uh, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And we often think that, well, well, something bad must have happened for for that person to be like that. Or something, you know, uh, God must not be powerful if he allowed all these things to happen. 
And it's the same thing. Who sinned? This, Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But that the works of God might be made manifest. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me. You see, the man had been born blind because God had a purpose. God had a purpose. Of course, he was a fallen man. He was a fallen creature. He was a sinner. He was born in sin. And God had allowed that. Why? Because Jesus would one day come along and he would perform that miracle for him that would show who Jesus was. The glory would go to God. And that's what Satan is always after. He is after stealing the glory. You know, Satan attacks the church, you and I, because he hates God. Jesus defended the glory of God. You remember when he drove the people from the temple? You know, they, they were buying and selling and doing all kinds of stuff that, that God had uh, not prescribed for them. And Jesus said, you have made my father's house a house, uh, he said, a den of thieves and robbers. You know any houses like that? <laughs> of thieves and robbers. And Jesus came. And he overturned their tables. He drove them out of the temple. And then the glory of God returned. You see, we are called, Jesus got rid of that which was robbing God of his glory in the temple. We're called to fight for the glory of God. We're not to fight for our own things and for their temporal things. We are to fight and stand for the glory of God. Some people have been so saturated by the culture that it is the things that are happening in the culture now is normal to them. They don't think anything about lying and cheating and lawlessness and stealing and bile. They don't think anything wrong with that. They think it's normal. And the reason they do is because, again, they have been overcome and taken over and influenced by the culture instead of God. They're so influenced by its corruption that they think it's okay now. There's so many people, even right now in our country, they know corruption is, is, is rampant, and they're okay with it. You say, what's wrong with that? Well, they don't understand who is promoting it, and they don't understand whose captive they are. But I believe that people are waking up. God is raising up a remnant of people to face the real battle that is raging. It is not cultural. Cultural is only the effect. It is a spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle between Satan and God, between angels and demons, between godly men and ungodly men, that spiritual battle is what affects the cultural battle. The reason people in our country and in nations of the world hate Christians and don't want them around, don't want them to influence government, don't want them to influence anything, is because they hate God. And Satan, the spirit of this age, is moving them. They think it's normal. They think it's fine. But they don't understand that they are captives in a battle, in a cosmic battle between Satan and God. So many are not engaged in the battle, even many Christians. And they don't think it's important. They don't give it much importance. So lies, deception, lawlessness, they don't worry about it. They don't, well, you know what? We, we just shouldn't worry about that. But let me tell you this. What is it that ruins the souls of men? Sin. Lies, deception, lawlessness. All those things ruin men and their character. And that's why it's important and ought to be important in our culture. We ought to stand against lawlessness. When people rise up and say, we ought to defund the law enforcement, we ought to defund, you know, the police, we say, no, we're not going to do that. People get up and say, well, you know, it, 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 truth is your truth, and my truth might be different. No, that's a lie. Truth, somebody was talking to me today and said, well, you know, there, there are so many, so many different points of view, truth, there's truth in everything. I said, no, truth, the, truth doesn't have different uh, uh, perspectives. Truth is truth. Truth is reality. As a matter of fact, you might believe something uh, in the physical realm that's not true, and it can kill you. You might think, you know, gravity is, is true for some people. It's not true for me. Well, if you jump off a high building, you're going to see that gravity doesn't care what you think about it. Because the truth is, is that gravity will bring you to the ground, and you will die. And so truth isn't negotiable. God is the one who is interested in men knowing the truth and he is the author of the truth. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
Go back there if you would with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Paul says, we are soldiers in this conflict, in this battle. Look at verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Who are you if you're a Christian? You're a soldier. Now, you got to be a good soldier. And good soldiers share in suffering for Christ. Share in suffering so that the glory of God can be known. And sometimes that means you have to stand in the spiritual fight and receive all the attacks, all the, you know, the name calling, everything. Or some even receive stoning and some even receive, you know, violence against them. But he said, you as a good soldier in this battle, fighting the battle, he says, you are to share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are soldiers in the battle for the souls of men in our culture. And there is suffering in this battle. Many of uh, Christians, many, maybe you're here today or you're watching, and you don't want that part. Well, you know, I like Jesus and I love, you know, talk about heaven and the glory of God and the blessings, but I don't like that suffering and battle stuff. Well, you might not like that stuff, but it's part, of, and part and parcel of being a Christian, being a believer. Now, Satan and demons, they mean to find out what side you're on. And they're going to find out what side you're on. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 28 and 29, listen, Jesus came to the other side and said to the country of the Gadarenes, and two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs. So fierce that no one, he says, could pass that way. Here's two guys demonized by the, the, the spirit of this age. They are under the control of demons, and they are violent. And he comes, Jesus comes to the country of the Gadarenes, and it says in verse 29 that uh, they cried out to him, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? You see, Satan knew, the demons knew what side Jesus was on. And it wasn't on their side. And that's why I said to Satan and demons, they mean to know what side you're on. And you're going to face the battle, whether you like it or not. You're going to be right in the middle. And they're going to kind of out you. They're going to, they're going to pressure you, and you're going to find out where you really stand. Do you stand as a soldier of Jesus Christ? Or do you get absorbed by the culture and the activity of the demon forces that are at work? These men were being used by demons. Think about that. And yet, Jesus set them free. So our enemies, folks, aren't people. They're not the politicians. They're not your wife. They're not the other party. They might be deceived. They might be doing things that dishonor God and displease God that you might have to stand against. But they're not our enemies. They're only vessels. They're only vessels that are being used by the God of this world in his fight against God. We can lose sight of the enemy when we confuse the vessel with the enemy. But Jesus came to deliver evil men from the evil one, didn't he? In Acts chapter 26 and verse 17, Paul writes this, Acts 17, 26, 17. He, God, uh, the Lord Jesus said to him, I'm delivering you from your people, that is from the Jews who are after him, and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. And from the power of who? Satan to God. Why? Because those men are captives of Satan. They are in darkness. They don't have the light of God. And so Paul is sent, as we are, with the gospel message to open their eyes. Because it is only the gospel that is the hope. We sing a song here that says, the gospel is the only hope for our nation. And it is. The gospel is the only thing, the power of God that can turn people from darkness to light and from the power that they are under, even though they don't know it, the power of Satan to God. How? By receiving the forgiveness of their sins. And it says, and they're giving a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is Jesus talking to Paul. Now, I've spent time with people who say they wanted to know God. And spent time with them and spent, uh, you know, uh, 
effort and energy with them, only to have them abandon the faith. But folks, that's the war for the souls of men. Satan, you might be spent time, you know, ministering to somebody, witnessing to them, and then all of a sudden they have no more interest. They say, you know, say, well, you know, don't come anymore. Or, you know what, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to hear that anymore. And, and they just kind of go, and you get disappointed. No, realize you have been doing your part to try to rescue them from the darkness to the light. And sometimes there's some that don't want to be rescued because there is a fight for the glory of God between Satan and God. That's the war for the souls of men. Now, Satan attacks in many ways. But how does Satan attack the advancement of the kingdom of God? Well, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me and verse 3. Paul tells us here what is going on in the spirit world. You see, the spirit world is invisible. You can't see it. But the Holy Spirit, through the apostle Paul and the other apostles, reveal for us what we need to understand about the spiritual kingdom. There is a kingdom right now in operation that is spiritual. Remember I told you at the beginning, there's these pagans. They're offering sacrifices to their gods. They think they're doing a good thing. But Paul says, listen, God, idols are nothing. They're offering what they're offering. They're offering, offering to God. They're offering it to demons. Because demons promote idolatry. There's only one God, not many gods. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3, he talks about the gospel. And he says in verse Three, if our gospel is veiled or hidden, if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden or veiled to those who are perishing, to those who are lost, he says. They are lost. Okay, how is this gospel veiled? Well, look at the previous verse. Go back to verse 2. By underhanded ways, cutting and tampering with the word of God. In other words, there are those who disgracefully and in underhanded ways practice cunning. They tamper with God's word. They change the message. They change the truth. But Paul says we refuse to practice cunning, disgraceful, underhanded ways, tampering with the word of God, changing it. In other words, false gospels and false teachings are one of the things that the devil uses in this spiritual war to blind people and damn them and their souls. Paul says we refuse to practice cunning or tempering with the word of God. But with an open statement of the truth, he says, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. He says because if our gospel is veiled, it's hidden. It is hidden from the lost, from those who are perishing. And who are those? Verse 4. They are the ones in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. You see, unbelief is the work of Satan in the heart and souls of men whom God desires to save. But the devil is active in this kingdom. And oftentimes we forget that men cannot come to God Unless the battle for the souls of men is fought. Jesus won the victory. We were given the message. And the God of this world blinds the mind. This is the activity of Satan. This is what we're dealing with in the war. Satan wants to blind people. To what? Look at what he says. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. Of the glory of of Christ, who is the image of God. Remember I told you that Satan hates the glory of Christ. He hates the glory of God. And he will attack anyone and anything that tries to show it. And therefore, he is busy blinding the minds of unbelievers. And he does it in many different ways. He does it by, I shared with you right there in verse 2, un, un, uh, uh, underhanded ways of people using the gospel to merchandise the gospel, to, to creating uh, narratives that aren't biblical, to changing the gospel to someone that it, something that it isn't. And that the devil uses to blind people, lies. He uses false religion. He uses the love of sin that people have, fleshly gratification. He uses and blinds people into unbelief. He uses deceitfulness. So as I look out into our country and I see the deceitfulness and the lies that are going on, the corruption, I know what's at work. It isn't God's work. That's not God's work. That's the devil's work. 
And when I see people saying, what lies? And I see people saying, you know, our news media flooded us with this months ago. You know, what violence? You know, what, what, you know, what violence? And you see the stores burning in the back, all right? Who is promoting that? That's the devil. That's Satan's work because he hates the glory of God. He hates the glory of God that we met, would be manifest in a human life in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what he hates. He hates the glory that shines on the face of Jesus and on the face and through the face of believers. In verse 6 here in the same chapter, he says, God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what the enemy hates. People blinded by Satan spiritually, they refuse the light. And you know one of the ways that you know that people refuse light? They refuse to be accountable. They refuse to be responsible human beings. Jesus said in John chapter 3, beginning at verse 18, and let's go over there and look at this for a moment. John chapter 3, Jesus speaks about these type of people here in verse 18. He says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, speaking of Christ, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You see, people are already condemned. They're already judged. People in unbelief are judged because of their unbelief. And then he says in verse 19, and this is the judgment. This is, he says, um, and this is the same word for condemnation that we just read. Whoever does not believe is already judged, is already condemned. And what is the condemnation? What is the judgment? Here it is. That light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. Now you say, well, why would people love darkness rather than the light? Because their works are evil. You see, that's the whole um, the place of man. That's where man stands before God. He has fallen, he is evil, and blinded by Satan. And that's where we fight the warfare for the souls of men. We have to understand that. We have to understand that people without Christ, they are without God and without hope in the world. You know, sometimes people say, well, you want to give people sinners hope. Well, you can't give sinners hope. The only hope you can offer sinners uh, that don't want Christ is temporal hope. That's the only thing you can do because they don't have eternal hope. Eternal hope only comes through knowing Jesus Christ. So Satan wants to blind people to have him refuse the light, have him refuse accountability. I was thinking about this today as I, as I spoke to you at the beginning about our culture and what I see going on right now. People are saying, well, there was no fraud. There was no, uh, you know, deception. And so they're saying, okay, well, let us investigate. No, you can't investigate. Just take our word for it. There wasn't any. And so people all begin to parrot that. And I noticed something today that really struck me. The people that even in, in, in stations that we thought before were kind of conservative, they're all protecting themselves. They're all parroting the same line. And I was appalled. I was said, I'm amazed. That they, all these people, all of a sudden, they're agreeing. Oh, yeah, we believe that. There was nothing. It's already been proven. There's nothing. Nothing's been proven because the case hasn't even been made. The courts didn't want to hear it. Our legislators didn't want to hear it. So the legislation and the judicial branches of our government, many of them, have already failed. They failed the American people. But why? Because there is something insidious at work behind that. People who won't acknowledge that, and they'll just say, well, you know what? It doesn't matter. Again, why? Because you're overtaken by the culture. And so when the moment you begin to speak up and say, wait a minute, you can't have all these people who were there, many of them who have uh, signed affidavits, right, that they could go to prison for lying if they're shown to be lying. You can't have all these people who come out. You can't have whistleblowers who put their job on the line for what? For something they know isn't true? People, you know, they will believe what isn't true until it costs them something. And so people who stand up and say, this is what I witnessed, this is what I saw, and just to disregard and to say it's not there, it's to refuse the light, it's to refuse accountability and responsibility. I was uh, listening to one of the comments by one of the attorneys that is fighting this battle and was talking to one of the governors and secretary of states of one of the states and said, uh, you know, there was a video 
of the cheating. There, there's an actual video of the cheating. And this governor and secretary of state said, oh, we've handled that. We had an investigation. We found it was nothing. And so the attorney says and challenges him and said, okay, well, give me the report. I haven't even seen that there was a report of an investigation. Well, just take our word for it. There was no investigation because they couldn't produce a report. You see, lying and deception are movements in the spiritual world of the devil. And people who refuse to, have, to be accountable only resist it because they know their works are evil. That's what Jesus said. Let me see, did I finish reading it? Everyone who does wickedness, look at verse 20. People love the darkness because they're evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light. Of course, you don't want accountability if you're doing things that are wrong. You don't want to come to the light because if you come to the light, your deeds will be exposed. Well, we don't want you to check up on anything. Just trust us. Take our word for it. They don't want their works examined because then it will expose them for who they are. And folks, that's the work of Satan. That's evil. And people who do wicked things hate the light. They don't, want to, they don't want accountability. Jesus said, lest their works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Whoever doesn't have anything to hide, he doesn't, he, he doesn't, he doesn't mind being, you know, examined. Examined. There's nothing. Because it isn't there. But it's only when people don't want accountability, they resist the light. And Jesus said, they do it because their e deeds and their works are evil. And Satan attacks not just lost people, but believers as well. In Luke chapter 22, let's go over there. Luke 22 verse 31. So it isn't just the fact that evil men, remember I told you that this battle is between godly men and evil men, not just in angels and demons, not just between Satan and God, which is the first level, but between godly people and ungodly people. In Luke 22 and verse 31. You know this story? Jesus tells Simon, uh, Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And if you'll follow back a little bit in the story, you find out why Satan could demand him. Because Simon had entered into Satan's territory. Pride had lifted him up. He thought everybody else would deny Jesus, but not me. Oh, no, not me. I'm better than everybody else. All right. So pride lifted him up. And Jesus said, Satan has demanded you. And it's true that he might sift you like wheat. But he said, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned again, or turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew that he was going to come back. Jesus prayed for him. See, God withholds us. God holds us in his hand. And even when we fall, we don't fall out of his hand. We fall in his hand. And God strengthens us. And God encourages us. And God lifts us up. And God brings us back to repentance, just like he did Peter. Because he understands that we can't do it alone. We can't fight this battle alone. That Satan doesn't really care, like I said, about you or me. Oh, he'll destroy us. Don't misunderstand me. He'll destroy you. He'll lead you off into all kinds of things that are disobedient to God. But the one he's really after is Christ. The one he's really after is God himself. And he wants to destroy not just the lost, but he wants to destroy believers as well. Satan wanted to destroy Peter. And Peter remembered this event, by the way. He wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, many years later, uh, he wrote this, be sober-minded, be watchful. I guess he learned his lesson, right? Your adversary, the devil. See, he knows, he understands the spiritual world. Your adversary, the devil. You have an adversary. And it isn't a person, it isn't a human being, it's the devil. And he prowls around like a roaring lion, he says, seeking someone to devour. Satan is looking for someone to devour. So what does he say to us? How do we keep ourselves in the middle of this battle? Well, he says, be sober-minded. That means have your life ordered before God. Be vigilant, watchful. It means keep your eyes open, your spiritual antennas up. Be spiritually aware of what's going on. You know, some people say, oh, you know, Pastor, I, I just don't feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I want to return back to church. Or I don't you know, have any desire to read the scriptures anymore. I used to love to read the scriptures. I just don't have any desire to read them any longer. I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, I used to tell people about the Lord, but, but now lately it's just, you know, you know what, it, what that is? You're under attack. That's what that is. The devil's trying to blind you to the things that God called you to do. 
And if you don't understand the spiritual battle, you'll get all depressed and you'll feel like, you know, and, you, and you'll get mad even at people who encourage you and say, hey, come on, you can't be out here. You can't just be up here and, and, uh, by yourself. You know, you, you, you're telling people about the Lord. Now you're just not doing anything anymore. What's wrong with you? Well, you're under attack. You see, because the enemy wants to stifle you, wants to destroy your witness, wants to destroy your testimony. He doesn't want you to bring glory to Christ through your life. That's what he doesn't want, and that's why he attacks you. Now, one of the things that, uh, that is important for us to understand in the spiritual battle is that, is that there is an attack on the transfer of our faith even. And where is that transfer of the faith? Where does that take place? It takes place in the family. And so Satan attacks not just unbelievers and believers. He attacks the family as a unit. And he begins by attacking the parents. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at this. And verse 3, Paul says this. The husband, he's talking about the relationship between a husband and wife, the intimacy between a husband and wife. And he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. In other words, he's talking about this intimacy of relationship between the husband and the wife. And then he says, he goes on, he says in verse 5, Do not deprive one another, in other words, of that, of those needs being met in that physical intimacy in the relationship as husband and wife, except by agreement... For a limited time, he says that you may devote yourselves to prayer. In other words, for spiritual matters, you should do that. But, he says, then come again together, watch this, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You see, the physical relationship of a love commitment in a marriage is so important to the health of that marriage and that family that Satan attacks it. He finds ways to attack it. He attacks the passing of righteousness to the next generation. How? By destroying the family unit, by destroying husbands and wives. When Satan gets us to be unlike God, he strikes a blow at God. But when we live the way we should live in obedience to God, we defend against the attacks that bring, uh, 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 that, that, that bring dishonor to God. And we are able by our lives and our obedience to bring glory to God. So Satan wants to destroy your intimate relationship with your husband, with your wife. He wants you to ignore it because then that way he can lead you in another direction. Lest Satan tempt you. And lest you think you're untemptable, right? You're already a captive if you believe that way. You've already fallen for the lie. Everybody is subject to temptation. Temptation is not a sin. It's when you give in to the temptation that you sin and that you do not reflect the glory of God. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 4, go back, go over there. This is how we defend, by the way, against the attacks of the enemy, of the attacks that are, that are going on in this war. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, Verse 11, whoever speaks, he must do so as one who speaks as the oracles or the words of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Now, why would he say that if you have a gift, whether it's speaking or whether it's serving, whatever gift you have, he said, do it and use it by the strength that God supplies. Use it for the purpose that God intended it. In order that, he says that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I want you to circle that in your Bible. Everything. In order that in everything, everything in your life, your personal life, your job, your marriage, your children, your relationships, in everything that you do, he says you ought to walk in a way that what you do glorifies, brings glory to God through Jesus Christ because to him belongs the glory. We are the image and glory bearers, as I said at the beginning. And that is why Satan, in his fight against God, because he can't reach God, he uses our, the intermediaries that carry his glory. And that's you and I. We have the privilege to bear the glory of God. And this is the aim of Satan in the spiritual war, to destroy God's glory in believers. And he uses 
everything that he can get his hands on. Did you know he uses false prophets and false teachers to rob God of his glory? People that teach you stuff that don't glorify, doesn't glorify God in your life? This is why people usually don't seek God's glory. <clears throat> and when they don't seek God's glory, they're an easy prey for false prophets. People who don't seek the glory of God and to glorify God in their life, they are liable to fall for anything that sounds good. And so Satan seeks to blind them. But those who come to the light, he seeks to devour them. He seeks to destroy, to ruin their usefulness. God, Satan wants to ruin your youthfulness so that you'll be worthless for the extension of the kingdom of God to bring him glory right here and right now. But tonight, you're either one or the other. You can't avoid the war. You're either in it and aware of it and soberly, living soberly and righteously before God, or you're a captive. I pray tonight that you understand where you are. And, and, it, and I'm sure that you probably already do. And hopefully the Holy Spirit enlightened you today. Because Satan, as I said, means to out you. He wants to know what side you're on. He came to Jesus wanting to know what side he was on. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? They, they understood he's not on our side. The devil, every time you get up in the morning, he ought to say, he's not on my side. You better believe it. I'm not on his side and neither should you. We were on his side at one time. And maybe you're listening tonight and you've never trusted in Christ. You've never given your heart to the Lord. And you are in that side right now. And the Lord's calling you over to his side. And he said, if you'll repent of your sin and you believe in Christ and you give your heart to him right now, you call upon his name, he will save you and he will bring you to the right side. The side of light, the side of truth, the side of glory. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone right now, every soul hearing right now, those that don't know you, those that don't understand the spiritual fight that they're in. I pray for their souls. I pray, Father God, that they understand that those things that have been moving in their life to live in a way that is displeasing to God is the work of the devil. And I pray, Father God, right now that they'll repent, that you'll tell God right now, Lord Jesus, save me. Come and change my heart and change my life. And if you're a believer tonight, that you would say, Lord, thank you for making me once again aware of the battle that we are in, that I am in. And that I'm an intermediary and that Hayton, Satan hates you. And so that's why he comes after me and after my family and after our church. But Father, I thank you for giving us wisdom and eyes to see and ears to hear the truth that we may be able to stand for the glory of Christ and the glory of Jesus in all that we do, Father. I thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I encourage you, be sober. Be vigilant. We're in the middle of this war. Satan wants to get at God. The only way he can get it is through you. But you must be committed to the fight. You must be willing to let God be God. You must be willing to humble yourself. And like he taught us to pray, Lord, your will be done on the earth. I was just as disappointed today with what is happening and what has happened. But I tell you what, I said to the Lord, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And I praised him and I thank him right now where you are. Praise him right now and say, thank you, God for all that you're doing. We don't understand everything, but we know you're in control. And we know good will come out of this because you always have a way of turning things for our good. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, the Lord richly bless you and keep you tonight. May the Lord's hand be upon you in all that you do. Trust Christ, believe in him, and turn to him if you haven't today, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen.